My first summer in Woods Hole was 1995 and I had just graduated from undergraduate. I um, went to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and my undergrad advisor, Ann Stewart, was a summer investigator who came here year after year after year. And the story goes, she says, this, this is the story which I of course don't remember, she says that you know she would leave to go to MBL for the summer and you know, she would describe it as this magical place that I became very captivated with. And so one day back in Chapel Hill, I said to her, you know, how can I get a chance to go to this MBL place? And, uh, and, and she said, do you want to go to MBL for the summer? And I said, yeah. She said, okay, well, here's what you have to do. You have to load up, you have to pack the whole lab, you have to load it up into the truck and you have to drive it a thousand miles from Chapel Hill to Woods Hole. She thought I would say, forget it, I'm not gonna do that. But instead I said, sure, okay, you bet. So I did this, I packed up the whole lab, I drove it up here and arrived around the 1st of June in 1995 and set up an electrophysiology rig and um, just immediately fell in love with the place and decided I have to come back every summer and I did, um, almost every summer until I guess 2012 when I was hired here permanently. I was at a position at the University of Texas in Austin and it was really, really great position at a university that I loved. And in 2011, MBL was you know, beginning to grow the Eugene Bell Center for Regenerative Biology and Tissue Engineering. And they had already hired a couple of people and they posted an ad in the springtime that literally just looked like me. I saw this ad and I said, you know, this is me, you know, to work on problems of regeneration and either, you know, a marine organism or a lower vertebrate, which is what we're doing because we're working with lampreys and spinal cord regeneration and um, using certain techniques. That's what we were doing. And so, you know, I saw this ad and I thought, I, I have to apply for this position because it was written for me and you know of course so did a hundred other people or so but I was very fortunate to be interviewed and to be the person that was selected so um, for me it was not only you know it was taking my dream job at my dream place in a place that you know, I consider home because even as you move around institutions year after year, you go back to MBL and MBL is your home. That's the constant. Yeah, that's, it's a whole lot of things, but if you can distill what it is about Woods Hole and the summer, it's basically the intensity with which people do science it's very intense, but it's also really fun. So it was clear to me that you know people didn't even notice that they were working until midnight or one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning because they were just having so much fun with science. And it's a deep love of science and a deep sense of community that you don't get at most other places. And you know, lots of collaborations. And you know, I could tell that there were people that had been coming here for decades and decades and decades, and they have their own unique kind of family here that they visit every summer. And so it was, you know, all of those things. It was intense science, it was really excellent science, it was collaborations, and the fact that everybody here is having fun doing their work that made me want to come back. And of course, I'm just, I'm an Aquarian, so I'm attached to the ocean naturally. Yeah, it's made a huge difference for my work. So um, I would say, you know, one of the main things is that I worked on the squid giant synapse for my graduate work. And so at that time, after I finished at the University of North Carolina, I went to Duke for graduate school where I was working with George Augustine, who's another summer investigator who's been coming here for about, I think, 35 years. And um, when you work on squid, squid don't live very well in captivity and so you have to go to the squid. So every summer we would make this caravan now with you know five physiology rigs and a big huge truck from Durham 
up to Woods Hole. And so, um, you know, so that, that was the reason because the MBL has expertise in um, collecting the squid and uh, the husbandry of the squid. They have, you know, special tanks that keep the squid alive longer than any other place in the world, actually. So if you work on squid, this is the place in the world to go. So that's one way in which it influenced me pretty heavily. And then beyond that, you know, year after year, even as I changed model organisms and even as I changed projects, the fact that the MBL has these state of the art facilities, there's, you know, an equipment loaner program that you can tap into to get high end equipment during the summer to support your research as you're moving to an empty lab space. Um, you know, there's the fellowship support that um, that I got a couple of years. There's also the fact that MBL has some of the best imaging capabilities in the world. Um, and also the other major impact is the intellectual resources of the neuroscience community that, you know, is my field. And so, you know, pretty much it's a who's who in neuroscience of people that come through here during the summer. And that's true for several other disciplines as well. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I can think of, I'll tell you, the, the first person that comes to mind is actually someone who still comes here year after year, and that's John Lisman. So one of the first summers that I came here, it must have been in the late 90s, I was still living on campus and I was eating my meals in Swope day after day after day after day. And, um, and one of the things you realize is very quickly is that a lot of the students will segregate to one table and the faculty will segregate to another table. But John was teaching, I think he was teaching in the neurobiology course, and he would always leave his friends behind and come and sit down at the table with the students. Who are you? And where do you work? And what do you work on? And how are you finding it at MBL? And that really struck me that somebody that I know is a famous person in the field would spend his meals sitting with the students, you know, me at the time, maybe a first or second year graduate student who hadn't even started, and he spent the time with us. I, I did participate one year in the course as a faculty member for neurobiology, but unlike most people, that's not what initially brought me here. I would say the vast majority of people that come here for the summer start out in one of the courses. Um, but I started out as a summer researcher. Um, yeah, there's another story, and it also relates back to the people that you meet here at MBL. So, in 2006, I was the associate director for the Grass Lab. And that summer, we had as one of the visitors to the laboratory a professor by the name of Ricardo Milady, who is at, oh, I can't remember if he's at UC Riverside or UC Irvine. I think he's at Irvine. And um, Ricardo Milady came and spent a couple of weeks in the grass lab. And I know him because he is you know, he is the, you know, one of the big fathers of synaptic transmission, which is what I study. So that's the process by which neurons in your brain and spinal cord communicate with one another. And he had done some of his early seminal work on the squid um, axons and synapses. And, and so here, here we were together, you know, maybe three decades later, he had done some of the early work on the synapses and I was doing some of the you know, new recent work on synapses, and I had decided to work on squid synapse that summer in the grass lab as well. And so we had this really interesting historical exchange about the field and the use of this organism and the importance of the MBL. We even did a joint interview that was, I think, um, posted up at the at the library. Um, and so that for me was, you know, I got to meet one of my heroes and work with him and you know, do something together with him. So I have this nice picture of us together holding a squid. Okay, so this picture is from 2006, and it's the beginning of the 4th of July parade, and it was Gary Borisi's first day on his job. 
And what was, uh, this is the grass laboratory. I was the associate director that year. And I made a sign that uh, says, bring back the logo, the new one's a no-go. So the backstory to this is that MBL had hired a consulting firm to rebrand the MBL. And they came up with a logo that would have replaced our beloved logo with lots of sea creatures and the one that has you know been in existence forever and that really defines the MBL. And so I was kind of, uh, you know, I was offended by this idea that our logo would be destroyed as a part of this new rebranding. And so I, I made this sign, bring back the logo, the new one's a no-go, and started walking down the street in the 4th of July parade, chanting this. And little by little, everybody in town started chanting with me, bring back the logo, the new one's a no-go. And this trickled on up to Gary, uh, who also heard it. And um, it became a big buzz about town. He wanted to know who had, who had the poster, what was this all about. And long story short, he and I had a conversation not long after that, and he said, well, I agree with you. I don't think we should get rid of the logo because it is so distinctive. It's MBL. So yes, it is. And he said, well, what do you think about the idea of having both logos? And I said, I think that would be just fine. So I hope that I had some small part in saving the logo on our t-shirts and everything that we know and love about the MBL. So there you go. Okay, so there's another classic summer story of something that has we don't think has happened at MBL since then and um, it was around 19 I want to say 1998 summer of 98 was an interesting summer so at the end of the 4th of July parade the grass lab that year had all made big models that represented their experimental organisms and one of the fellows had made this giant frog out of chicken wire and two by fours and you know stretched a sheet over it and painted it green big eyes the whole thing and this you know this thing was probably you know eight or ten feet long and you know six feet or four feet wide it was an enormous frog and so of course at the end of the parade he didn't know what to do with the frog so he threw it outside on the lawn of Swope and there it sat for a couple of hours and then somehow, later on that evening, after celebrations of the 4th of July begin, the frog ends up on the roof of the, um, of the Drew house, where it stayed for a night. The next day it gets pulled back down and suddenly this became a, you know, a huge game across all of campus. So the frog spent the next three weeks going from place to place to place and every group every course in the MBL and the undergrads who were doing research all tried to figure out where the frog was going to be and steal it so the next place the frog ended up was hanging down from the rafters in Lurb and then the frog showed up the next day on the auditorium on the um, stage in Lily and then somebody tied styrofoam to the bottom of the frog and threw it out in eel pond. The frog ended up in eel pond. And every time, you know, one or two days would go by before the frog would appear again. And sometimes it was physiology course, the embryology course got it, the undergrads got it, another faction of the undergrads got it. And then um, the next thing that happened was somebody hoisted it down from the side of brick dorm. Okay, so there it is, hanging on the wall overnight, and um, somebody from facilities came by and took it down. Well, I was living in the brick dorm, which is now Ebert Hall. I was living in the brick dorm in a very tiny single room that, that year. And I happened to walk over to Swope, and I saw the frog sitting on the ground beside Ebert Hall, or beside brick dorm. I looked around, <laughs> nobody was looking, so I dragged the frog up to my room, stuffed it in my room. It filled up the entire room because it was so big and my room was so small, and shut the door. Nobody saw me. Left the frog there for about a week and a half. And uh, <laughs> so, wanted signs showed up all over campus. Where is our frog? Who has stolen our frog? Please give us our frog back. 
So I responded by, with you know, three of my very trusted friends. So we responded together by writing a ransom note. So we said, okay, if you meet us on Wednesday morning at 10:30 a.m. in the you know in the bank with um, some you know lollipops and a bottle of champagne and I don't even remember what else, we will give you the frog back, which of course we didn't do. So we got caught. Um, he knew who it was. We kept the frog. And then later on that night, a friend of mine <laughs> came over with her boat. We put the frog on the boat and we drove it over to the bridge and we tied it to the bottom of the drawbridge so that in, next morning the bridge goes up, the frog jumps. <laughs> and I can truthfully say that's the last we saw of the frog.